Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to our read-through of The Hero of Kendrickstone. Chapter 5, An Object Lesson Even as the days grow shorter and colder, the bandit attacks increase with strength and frequency. Soon, the news of new bandit raids comes every day. Tales of black-clad marauders striking from the forest around the city become familiar to every man, woman, and child within the walls of Kendrickstone. The three major roads leading to Kendrickstone's gates are rendered all but impassable by constant attacks. As the last harvest of the year starts, the worry becomes palpable. There is only enough farmland around the city to feed two-thirds of the city's population. The rest must be shipped from, front from frontier homesteads in the Iron Marshes or the vast noble estates near the coast. With the bandits in black menacing the roads, far too many of the food caravans simply don't take the risk. Most of those that do are waylaid and slaughtered. The prices of bread, ale, and beef skyrocket in Kendrickstone, and with them, the price of everything else, raised by crafters, laborers, and publish publis publicans desperate to feed themselves. Every week, the Duke's knights sortie into the forest in search of bandit camps. They find nothing. The steadily increasing cost of living is something you feel keenly as the autumn progresses. As the weeks pass, the price of the room and board in the Blazing Sword increases too. I'm sorry, Isabel, Frida the innkeeper says as she raises the rent for the third time in one month. It's the only way I can break even, with food and firewood climbing the way they are. When the bandit attacks stop, I'll drop the prom prices again, I promise. For now, times are hard for everyone. You begin to notice fewer and fewer people in the Blazing Swords as the Sword as the weeks continue. More than once, you come upon Frida and her husband discussing the situation in hushed tones, though they try to keep any worry from you. Winter will drive the winter winter will drive the bandits out of the woods. No one can live No one can live there through one of our winters, Frida assures you. Then the traders will come back, and the prices will come back down. Just you wait. Until then uh, still, until then, you need a way to make up enough money for rent and food until you have a shot and another big job. Ultimately, you end up... Why did we have any issue with the in-house poet? We're renowned as it. Okay. With the... With your skillful tongue and quick wit, you quickly find a minor noble family willing to pay you a generous fee to write and perform verses of poetry for them and their guests during special occasions. It is a highly satisfactory arrangement at first. Your obvious talent at both writing clever turns of phrase and delivering them before an audience increases your fame and the status of your employers for acting as your patron. Still, it soon becomes clear that even the amount of money you are making Rising prices are cutting your profit margin thinner and thinner by the day. Regardless, at the end of the day, you must still return to the blazing sword. With prices rising higher than wages, you've had to take a long, hard look at your spending. Oh, wow. Is it even possible to have 500 silver at this point? Like, what? How much money do we have? We have 174. We're going to keep... And we're going to keep at the small room and eat well. You rent out one of the smaller rooms in the Blazing Sword. While it isn't the immense suite on the top floor, it still offers the luxury of a private bedchamber, which is more than the poor folk who sleep in the common room can say. The narrow bed and simple furnishings are more than comfortable enough, especially for one used to even smaller rooms back at the Leaping Lion. Your rent pays for your meals, too. And at first your food is simple, but of high quality. Pottage, beef stew, white bread, and all the rich brown ale you can drink. However, as the days grow colder, you notice your bread getting coarser and coarser, and a bit less meat in your stew. Even your drink seems to be getting thin, thinner and more pale. It cannot be helped, Frida tells you. Thanks to the bandit raids, the price of food is on the rise, as is everything in the city. Her choice was to either lower the quality of food or raise the rent even more, and she chose to do the former. Still, you've had plenty to be thankful for. Not everyone is lucky enough to afford a room for themselves and warm meals every day. By the standards of Kendrick's poor, you are still living in luxury. After your meal, 
you still have a few hours before you sleep. With your days taken up by work, this is the only free time you have. How do you spend it? Let's, uh, let's keep, keep on keeping on. What we were doing initially wasn't working, but uh, let's keep doing it. Each night, you head out. Kendrickstone has many alehouses, at least half a dozen of them within a few minutes of your lodging. By the beginning of winter, you visited them all. Amidst the warm file fires of the rush-floored halls, you seek companionship to give warmth to the autumn nights. Once again, young women seem to gravitate towards you, hanging off your every word, smiling at every glance. Ah, uh, let's settle down a little bit. Let's see what uh, comes of that. We'll change our ways a little bit. Your goal is to find someone special, someone who might bring, become your partner, if not just for a night, but for all the years to come. After a few false starts, you finally seem to stumble across the one. A young tallow chandler's apprentice, brash and headstrong, but bright and full of un and in, uh, unending enthusiasm. Alas, it is not to be. A month before winter starts, her master makes the decision to escape Kendrickstone's rising prices by moving Shrop to Thornhall. She goes with him. Aw, heartbreak. Aside from your daily life, there is one last pressing matter. The writ of protection given to you by William of Halliford when you first arrived in the city has now expired. Will you pay the silver for the renewed writ, or will you refuse and risk the wrath of powerful, the powerful crime lord? Oh shit, we can't even afford... <laughs> I guess the price has gone up, because it used to be 30 silver, but... Uh... I wish I could, but I don't have the money. That's not the attitude we want to, uh... It's not the attitude we want to have. I'm not afraid is really what it is. We're not afraid. You decide against buying a new writ of protection. You're sure that you can handle whatever William of Halliford sends your way, now that you've gotten your barons in the big city. It turns out you are wrong. One morning, you wake to find a dagger pinned to your bedpost. The message is an obvious one. Even in your own bed, you are not safe without that all-important sealed piece of paper. Needless to say, you don't exactly sleep well for the next few weeks. Oh, shit. Does that hurt us? Uh, not, not really. It doesn't give us any boost, but whatever. One day, as you are in the city on an errand, a young woman in grey, nondescript clothes, dashes through the crowd, using her small size and light feet to slip through the throngs of pedestrians. She runs to you and wordlessly hands you a folded piece of paper, sealed with the unmistakable crest of William of Halford. You open the note and read it quickly. Isabel, your presence is required immediately at my residence. A friend. There is no question that the matter mentioned in the note is urgent. Though the crime lord's house is halfway across the city, you have become familiar enough with Krendikstron's streets and are there within half an hour. As soon as you approach the door, a pair of guards appear to usher you in. You are taken beyond the ornately appointed great hall, up a set of stairs, and into a small room, where William of Holliford waits himself awaits. Please sit down, Isabel. I don't remember his voice at all. He says, motioning to a chair opposite his desk with one hand as he pours two cups of wine with the other. So, he says as you sit down, you are still an adventurer, are you not? Still looking for jobs? You nod. William of Holliford smiles as he takes one of the cup, uh, cups and pushes it towards you over the polished wooden desktop, the deep red liquid rippling in its burnished brass container. Good, very good. Then perhaps I have an offer for you. One I expect you shall accept. Uh, what do you want me to do? Instead of answering your question directly, William of Hollowford reaches inside his doublet and pulls out a small piece of parchment. With two fingers, he pushes it across the desk. Do you know what this is? He asks. You pick up the pa paper. On the drawing of... <clears throat> On it is a drawing of an emblem of some sort. A bird in flight surrounded by a pair of concentric circles. It's hardly much to go on. Trading houses, noble families, even city functionaries all have their own such emblems, and you've never seen this particular one before. You shake your head. 
That emblem, William explains, is the sigil of the House of Swanfall, a wealthy noble house hailing from the Duchy of Thornhall. What does this have to do with us? You reply. Thornhall's a week's ride to the north. The crime boss nods. Indeed, but one of House Swanfall's younger sons, a Lord Berwick, lives in a mains in Kendrickstone. His conduct is of very great concern to me, and by extension, you. William of Halliford leans forward in his chair, swirling the wine in his goblet around as he explains. Up until very recently, Lord Berwick and his family have paid for their protection promptly. However, for the last two months, no payment has been forthcoming. William of Halliford takes a sip from his goblet and leans forward, resting his elbows firmly on the top of his desk. Perhaps the man thinks his high birth or the distant influence of his family makes him impervious to the chastisement I might wish to lay upon him. I need you to prove him wrong. All right, you reply, your tone sour. So you want me to attack a man for not paying you off. Is that all? William of Holliford shakes his hand. Hardly that, he says easily. I do not wish harm upon the man. I merely need to offer him a reminder of the value of my protection. Like the reminder your thugs gave me a few weeks back? Your reply is bitter. You're pretty sure the man sitting opposite you knows exactly what you're talking about, but he gives absolutely no sign of it. Why? Were you attacked or threatened? He asks innocently. If you had paid for your writ of protection, I'd be bound to track down the culprits. But since you have not... He shrugs his shoulders in a convincing display of innocence. The well-groomed man leans back in his chair, his fingers steepled together. What I require of you is quite simple, really. Lord Berwick has in his possession a rather valuable heirloom chalice, the relic of a flowering of the flowering court, in surprisingly good condition, which I have wanted for my collection for quite some time. I need you to gain entrance to his house in Kendrickstone and steal it. William's eyes narrow as he grins cat-like. That will not only provide me with a nice centerpiece for my collection, but it shall also convince Lord Berwick that there is no substitute for the protection I offer. So, are you interested? Hmm. Let's do it. We'll take up his offer, and if we can get into the house by posing as a bard, because our subterfuge is shit, 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 so... We might be able to talk our, talk that chalice out of the... The crime lord smiles. Very good, he exclaims. I am sure we shall both find this venture a most profitable one. William reaches for his goblet and raises it in a toast. You take your own and raise it as well. The two brass vessels meet before you with a hollow clink, and before you, and you bring yours to your lips. The wine is switch, oh my gosh, switch? Sweet and rich, with an aroma that brings to mind scenes of dancing pixies and fluttering rose petals. You drain your cup in a single swallow. Now, the well-groomed man says as he puts down his empty cup, I suppose you must have other questions in mind. Uh, we know it's illegal. We're not even going to bother asking that. I'm getting paid, right? William of Holliford responds with laughter, not his normal Eubane chuckle, but a genuine belly laugh. Do you take me for some sort of beggar girl, capable of repaying you with nothing more than thanks and a blessing? He says as his laughter finally fades. I have considerable resources at my disposal. I could offer you gold, fame, even a position in my organization, if you should wish it. All right, well, let's see. When do you want it done? William of Halliford plucks a gold coin from his belt with one hand as he idly refills his goblet with the other. Lord Berwick is what I might call an unstable element. With one hand, the crime lord flips the heavy coin in the air, catching it in the back of his knuckles. While it has quite unlikely that he'll learn of this meeting, there is always the possibility that he already has. That may render him prone to rashness, shall we say. The man opposite you continues rolling the coin in his knuckles, in the one hand as he speaks, his motions almost unconscious. To minimize the risk, I would expect you to act as quickly as you can. Tonight, if possible. Tonight? That's not much time to prepare at all. Despite the Crime Lord's assurances, you have no doubt that the job before you will be a risky one, a mission that will test, all, that might test all of your skills. I should go and make some preparations, you reply. Of course, William replies, his smile still easy. Just be ready by tonight, and if you encounter Lord Berwick, keep him alive. 
He can't pay his fees if he's a corpse. He turns to the guards at the door. Show my young friend out, if you please. I like where this story is going. It is only a few minutes of wandering. It only takes you a few minutes of wandering the wide open roads of the wealthy Brightwall district to find Lord Berwick's mains. Considering the man's family sigil is proudly emblazoned on the gate, you would have to have been an idiot to have missed it. Of course, finding it is the easy part. It'll be getting in once night comes that'll be the hard bit, especially considering what you're up against. The most obvious obstacle in your way is the wall that surrounds the entire complex, made of stone and a head taller than you. Worse yet, the stones have been cut smooth and fitted tightly together. You'll find no easy handholds if you choose to go in over the wall. The gates might even be in a worse proposition. Even from the street, you can see a pair of livered ster servants at the front gate, each carrying a sword and a dagger. You could probably subdue them if you're lucky. They're armed servants, not soldiers. But unless you can take them both down quickly, they'll be able to sound the alarm and bring who knows how many others upon your head. The sun is low in the sky now. Night comes early this time of year. You reckon you probably have another hour before the shops close. If you're planning on getting some extra equipment, now's the time to do it. Alternatively, you could always spend the time snooping around Lord Berwick's, Berwick's property, perhaps looking for easier ways in. Finally, you could see if you couldn't dig up some additional information on Lord Berwick and his households in the nearby ale shops. Perhaps you'll learn something useful? Uh, how much money do we have? We got 20... Shopping is worthless. We got no money to our name, and we're going to need it for our food and drink, so... Let's go gossip. Ale houses are common businesses in Kendrickstone. It doesn't take long for you to find one near Lord Berwick's estate. You step through the door, put down a few coppers in it for a tankard of cheap sour ale, and sit in a corner, hoping not to be noticed as you listen in on conversations around you. It doesn't take more than a few minutes to overhear something promising. The bastard... Oh, the bastard hasn't paid us nearly two months now, a woman grumbles in the booth next to yours. If this keeps up, I'm nicking the silverware, walking out, taking the service at the keep. Is that such a good idea? Another woman's voice is asked. A high-born lord like yours will bear a grudge. Surely it can't be that bad. The other woman spits in response. It's worse. That bastard's been shorting me on ale rations, and the other guards too. Why do you think I'm driving, drinking here? Lord Berwick can go plow himself. So, your target hasn't been paying his guards. Hmm, well that, perhaps that will make getting in easier than expected. You finish your tankard and head back out. You make your way quickly to Lord Berwick's complex, arriving just as the sun slips below the horizon. Awesome, if they're underpaid, we could totally talk our way in. With the coming of night, the streets clear quickly. The throngs of people crowding the streets of Kendrickstone just minutes ago have retreated into their homes, alehouses, and inns, and the only light remaining or remaining light coming from the distant starry sky and the open windows of buildings around you. The wide cobbled streets of the Brightwall district are empty. You stand before the gate to Lord Berwick's walled estate and consider your options. The first and most obvious approach would be to go right through the front gate. That would also mean going right through the guards. If you mean to kill or incapacitate them, you'll have to do it quickly before they can raise the alarm and bring the guards down from other parts of the house to their aid. Of course, you could always just try to bribe your way through. If the guards truly haven't been paid for two months, they would be likely very susceptible. Alternatively, you could try to talk your way through, if you feel like your wits are sharp enough. You could also pick a dark secluded spot and try and scale the wall. While you, while you should be able to get over without much trouble, doing so un... Scene might be a bit more difficult. Well, we're bluffing our way in. You approach the gate, expression intent. The two guards are standing in some sort of so are standing in the soft orange light thrown by a wall-mounted torch. Both are armed, but neither seems particularly alert. As you come closer, one of the guards steps forward, holding out his hand for you to signal to stop. His moments are slow, and his expression is far from alert. Halt! He orders in a voice laden with more boredom than suspicion. State your business. I have an important message, you reply, lowering your hand to your belt pouch as if it contained some folded missive, from Lord Berwick's brother in Thornhall. The guard looks you up and down for a moment, then nods and beckons for you to follow him. Nice. 
You congratulate yourself mentally on the cleverness of your deception. If you were a messenger from within the city, you'd have to explain your weapons and adventuring gear, but anyone traveling to Kendrickstone from somewhere else would be certainly well as equipped as you uh, would certainly be as well equipped as you are. After all, the roads are full of bandits. Hold on, what's this? The other guard says as the two of you draw close, his eyes narrowing in suspicion. Apparently, your self-congratulation came on a little too soon. A messenger from Thornhall, from Lord Borwick. Uh, a messenger from Thornhall, Lord Borwick's brother. The first guard replies, in still, in st still in that same bored tone. Oh man, I'm choking on my words here. The other guard shakes her head. We're not to let anyone in tonight. Lord Barrick's orders, remember? She turns to you. If you've got a message, come back in the morning. You try to raise protest, but nothing comes to your mouth to sway the two guards. This isn't good. You're losing your cool, and as you grow more and more nervous, the guards grow more and more suspicious. Before long, they are all but ordering you to leave. What now? Hmm. Let's go for it. Talking won't work, I'll fight my way in. Magic seems like it would have been so much more useful than anything else. But, hey. Hindsight. Smack him over the head with the loot! You spring forward, bringing your staff into a strike position. The guard nearest you notices the weapon in your hands just a moment too late. His hand reaches for a sword, but you are already apart upon him. You swing the length of the stout, wooden, stout wood in a tight arc, knocking the man to the ground. He doesn't get back up again. The second guard stares, slack-jawed, before she even draws her sword. You move forward as fast as you can, but the other guard is ready for you by the time you get within reach. She lunges forward, swinging at your head, and you parry just in time, her blade striking a deep notch in your staff. As you recover your stance, the enemy swings, swings again, this time at your side. Before you can parry again, she redirects her cut into a thrust. A feign. Panicking, you spring to the side. A, si a line of pain burns in your side as your foe's sword scores a cut just above your hip. Your opponent leaps back as you recover. Alarm! She shouts. Intruder at the front gate! Uh-oh. For a few moments, the two of you simply stare at each other, her blade facing off against your staff. Your opponent smir smirks cruelly. Why shouldn't she? Now that she has raised the alarm, the full force of Lord Barrick's guard should be coming to her rescue any second. Any second. Slowly, the guard's expression turns to confusion, as she realizes that backup isn't coming. Naturally, you use this to your advantage. Before your opponent can react, you lunge forward, slamming the tip of your staff into her belly. As she doubles over, gasping for breath, you bring your staff down on her back of her head, sending her tumbling limply to the ground. What the hell? Okay. <laughs> With the guards taken care of, you push the gate open and step into Lord Barrick's estate. Before you stands the imposing stone and timber bulk of Lord Barrick's mansion. Open windows flood the air around them with the soft orange glow of candlelight. Carefully, you make your way towards the building. You move as fast as you can, hoping that nobody looks out a window and spots you moving across the yard. Nobody does. Within moments, you are able to find a side door and slip inside. I have no idea why <laughs> the guards aren't here, but awesome. It takes a few moments for your eyes to adjust to the light from the candles and lamps. When you finally open your eyes again without squinting, you find yourself in some sort of storage room. Immense casks sit on the sides of, in two rows, one on each side of the cool stone-floored room. Iron taps stick out from the heads of each. You turn one of the taps experimentally. Perhaps good Lord Berwick has good taste in ale, but nothing comes out. You try the others, and, sure enough, they're all empty. After a few minutes of searching the hallways and rooms for the, around the storage room, you realize that the casks aren't the only thing empty. The entire house is deserted. There are none of the sounds of a household, either waking or asleep. The two guards at the front may very well have been the only two people on the estate. Despite this, it is clear that the building has not been empty for long. The smells of cooked meat, spilled ale, unwashed linens, and stale bodies remain. 
Someone had to have lit the candles, too. The inhabitants could not have been gone for long, which means they could come back at any moment. However, with the house currently deserted, you no longer have to worry about stealth. It won't take you long to search the place for the chalice. Then, another thought hits you. With the mansion deserted, what's to stop you from helping yourself to the rest of Lord Varric's valuables? Surely a house this big would have something worth misplacing. Still, your time is limited. What do you do first? We get the job done. We find the chalice. The sooner you find the chalice, the sooner you can actually get out. Unfortunately, that seems easier said than done. You search every room of the place, looking in closed cupboards, cabinets, and closets, keenly aware that every nook and door you open up could lead to a deadly trap or alarm. You find linens, cookware, chamber pots, books, a few lewd messages in a servant's hand, bottles of perfume, and a rather over decored war hammer. What you don't find is the chalice you are looking for. Perhaps the thing has been placed in some sort of secret vault or hidden a compartment. If only you had a clue. A piece of paper is resting in one of the niches set in the wall, and the main a piece of paper resting in one of the niches set in the wall of the main hall catches your eye. All the other niches hold some artifacts of some sort vases, amulets, strange looking statuettes. This one only holds a scrap of parchment. Curiously, you pick it up and read it. Remember, the chalice is being taken to the docks for the exchange tonight. Do not report it stolen. The bottom of the paper bears the unmistakable squeal, uh, squeal, wax seal of this Lord Berwick of Swanfall. Experimentally, you wipe your finger along one of the ink blots of the notes. It comes away stained black. This note couldn't have been written more than an hour ago. The exchange, whatever that is, is happening tonight. You take a deep breath to gather your thoughts and options. Judging by the state of the house and the note, you doubt that Lord Beric left with the chalice very long ago. If you are quick and lucky, you still might have time to get to the docks and stop it before he makes the exchange, whatever it might be. If you let him go through with it, you're quite sure that the chalice will not end up in your hands. However, you don't know what, ch what treasures still might be hidden in the house. A hidden coffer or strong box, maybe? Could there be a chance that you'll be able to stay a little longer without letting the chalice slip away? Perhaps there is. Every moment you spend here means your chances of getting the chalice before it slips from your hands permanently decrease, but that doesn't mean the risk isn't an acceptable one, right? I'd love to, What's the difference between these two? Uh, just let's get the job done. I don't want to be doing this job any more than anybody else, so... The chalice and the mission from William of Holliford comes before all else, as it should. Every second you delay increases the chance that your quest will fail. You need to get to the docks, now. You slip out the same way you came back in, back into the yard. It only takes a few moments for your eyes to adjust to the darkness. You rush through the front gate, passing the fallen bodies of the guards where they lay. Their comrades will find them there when they return. In the meantime, you run down the darkened streets towards the docks district. You run down the darkened streets of Brightwall district as fast as you can, knowing that every second lost might make you a second too late. Before long, the wide, neatly cobbled boulevards of the wealthiest quarter of the city turn into the narrow, muddy streets of the remainder. Your lungs are already starting to burn. You push yourself to keep running, but soon you must stop, leaning against the side of a half-timbered houses as you regain your breath in ragged, half-choking gasps. If only your legs were stronger, your endurance greater. Now you must pay for the weakness of your body with the precious time you spend recovering before you set off once again. And that's a good thing we left when we did then. Before long, you sprint into the maze of warehouses that surround Kendrick Stone's commercial harbor. Frantically, you run through every single wharf, taking the valuable moments to look for the Aaron Noble and his guards. If only you knew enough about the workings of the dock to know where the exchange would most likely be taking place. Finally, you turn a corner to see a darkened figure in the fur-trimmed cloak of a white of a noble, surrounded by distinctive silhouettes of armed men and women. It is Lord Beric for sure, but his hands are empty. You crane your neck around the corner for a better look, and your heart sinks. Sailing away from the dock on a small skiff is a small skiff. On board are two or three dark figures. One of them is holding the chalice. You are too late. Son of a...
bitch. The chalice is beyond your reach now. Your mission has failed. However, you have a lot of questions and very few answers. Why did Lord Barrett trade away the chalice in the first place? Why has he stopped paying protection money? Why is his house full of house empty of servants and family? At the moment, though, the man seems rather dis disinclined to give you answers, surrounded as he is by four armed guards. If you could best them in combat or find some other way to neutralize them, though, you bet the nobleman would be turn very cooperative very quickly. So what do you do? Uh, centrifuge? No. Let's just ask. Let's step out and ask him. You step out into the open wharf, into the dull light cast in the torch by the hands of one of Lord Barrick's guards. The same guards who whirl around to face you, their hands reaching for their weapons. What? Lord Barrick turns a moment after his escorts do. The thin, bearded man recoils in shock as he gazes upon your white weapons and gear. His eyes, already he hectic with paranoia, narrow suspiciously. Guards! He shrieks, his voice laden with fear. An assassin! Defend me! You are no assassin. That is clear to your would-be opponents. They look over you appraisingly, their hands gripping on the still-sheathed swords. However, Lord's barrack paranoia appears to have gotten the better of him. Defend me! A gold coin to the one who takes her down! Coin gets the guards to do what loyalty to their master would not. They are, these are, after all, hirelings. The four guards draw their blades and advance upon you. It looks like you've got a fight on your hands. Wait, why can't I bluff? Why can't I bluff? That's my thing, I bluff. Why can't I bluff? Son of a... Okay, well, I guess we fight. Son of a bitch. The guards approach you as you ready your staff. Two, attack, two prepare to attack from head on, while the other two circle you to each side. You keep your assailants at bay with wide, twirling sweeps of your staff. The last thing you want is for the guards to close in and surround you. Should that happen, they will have the advantage, both in numbers and in the fact that their swords are a lot handier and more agile than your staff. After a few moments, one impudious guard tries to get through your defense. Bringing your staff around, you strike the attacker in the arm with bone-shattering force. The guard cries out in pain as her sword flies from her hand, and she falls back, cradling her now-broken arm. Only then do you realize that dealing with one attacker has left you open to the others. Two more guards dart in, blades at the ready, attacking from opposite directions. Hastily, you bring your sword staff up to block one attack. You then feel the back of your head explode in pain, and the world goes black. You wake up in a narrow bed in a dark room. For a few moments, you lie in darkness, regaining your wits and your memories. You remember the shimmering of bare steel against the starlight. You remember those sharp blades cutting into your flesh, your strength fleeing in your body. You remember falling. The door opens. Ah, good, says William of Holliford as he steps into the dark room, lamp in hand. You're awake! What happened? You hear yourself replying. The well-groomed man pulls up a chair and sits down by your side. I'm afraid you were overcome by Lord Berwick's guards last night. The guards sought you to bring you to the keep for a rest, but thankfully I was able to get you rescued. I also had a healer look at your wounds. Let it be said that I do not guard for the well-being of those who choose to work for me. You prop yourself and look under your covers. Sure enough, the cuts you remember taking last night are gone, replaced with the faint telltale scars of wounds recently healed by magic. Suddenly, the blood seems to rush from your head and you begin to feel dizzy. Careful, William warns you as he pushes you back down. You lost a great deal of blood last night. Healing magic won't can't restore that. You'll still be weak until your body can replenish it. He pauses. Tell me about the chalice. Were you able to recover it? You shake your head. No, it's gone. Lord Barrick traded it away. William sighs and his shoulders sag. How unfortunate. I had rather hoped to get my hands on it. I suppose I can't now. Lord Berwick made his payments this morning. He is under my protection again. The connection in your mind is obvious. Whatever the nobleman traded for the chalice for gave him the means to pay William of Halliford in return. It seems everyone made themselves a tidy fortune from the exchange. Everyone except you. 
The crime lord stands up again, shaking his head. I had hoped you would succeed where my agents were likely to fail. I'm afraid that as extraordinary as your talents are, I appeared to have overestimated them. With that, he turns to leave. Perhaps one day I might find another job for you, more suited for your skills. Until then, you'd best return to your lodgings to hone your skills further. With that, he is gone, and you are once again in darkness. Jeez, we failed frickin' everything so far. By mid-afternoon, you find yourself well enough to make your way back to the Blazing Sword, weighed down by the iron lump of failure in your stomach. Other chances will come, you tell yourself, but not today. As the weeks pass and the winter continues, the days become grayer and colder and full of snow. And yet, the bandit attacks continue to worsen. And with that, chapter 6. Oh man, we're just getting our ass kicked left, right, and center. But we have to live up to the name of the book, so we will. Till next time, guys. Later.